My name is Karen Hale. I am with uh, the Hazardous Waste Program with Ohio EPA. I have worked in the Hazardous Waste Program for 27 years. Um, a portion of my duties include uh, helping develop rules, adopting rules, uh, keeping an eye on what the federal EPA is doing, what rules they are, they are uh, putting together, and also uh, assisting the regulated community as well as our inspectors uh, regarding uh, questions and complicated scenarios uh, dealing with the hazardous waste rules in general. So, today we're going to talk about the Universal Waste Program. Uh, the segments of the webinar include what are the advantages to the Universal Waste Program. Uh, we're going to give a very brief overview of the standards uh, applicable to Universal Waste. Then we're going to go over issues of confusion. Uh, in this segment of the, the webinar, I'll go over different types of specific issues that have been causing some of the people who have contacted uh, Ohio EPA, uh, you know, confusion, uh, uncertainty on how the rules work. And then um, I will also be going over and giving an update on the rulemaking that Ohio EPA is doing in the Hazardous Waste Program and also uh, what you might expect from U.S. EPA in the uh, upcoming year regarding uh, hazardous waste rules. And then the latter part of the webinar I'll be, uh, will be open to a, a question and answer session. So. Um, in general, the universal waste rules were developed to promote the recycling and disposal of the designated waste under the universal waste rules. Uh, universal waste had been found to be maybe not properly um, managed by generators. They were often overlooked as not being hazardous or not being concerned and were often found um, in the normal trash. Uh, at, uh, you know, commercial, industrial facilities, retail facilities. So that made them prime candidates to, um, uh, to be uh, classified as a universal waste. Now for the generator and the, uh, for the generator, universal waste do not count towards your monthly hazardous waste generation rate. So that's a, that's a real plus for the generators. Um, also, a generator is not required to determine whether the hazardous waste, whether the universal waste is a hazardous waste. You do not need to make a waste evaluation or determination. Um, basically, by following the universal waste rules, you are making the conclusion that your waste is a hazardous waste, subject to less uh, burdensome rules. Uh, Recycling of universal waste is, is encouraged, but it is not required. And there is no man hazardous waste manifest required when transporting a universal waste to another handler or to a destination facility. The Ohio specific universal waste that we adopted, um, they were adopted in December of 2017 and became effective on December 21st, 2017, and the 21st happens to be my birthday, and yes, I took advantage of the opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, the waste in question are non-empty aerosol cans, uh, or containers, antifreeze, paint, and paint-related waste. So first we're going to go over the definitions of aerosol containers. Uh, one through, thing through the research that I did, I found out that aerosol containers are not just metal. There is new technology um, that has been developed and plastic aerosol containers are now coming on the market. And there are also some glass aerosol containers out there. So uh, it is not limited to metal containers. But in general, an aerosol container is non-openable and non-refillable container that holds a substance under pressure and uses a propellant gas to deliver the product. And aerosol container does not include gas cylinders. Gas cylinders do not operate um, 
in the manner defined for aerosol containers. Next is antifreeze. Antifreeze is ethylene or propylene glycol used in heat transfer equipment or to winterize equipment. This can either be heat transfer equipment, can be either from a vehicle, it can be at an industrial commercial facility, retailer, it just needs to be a heat transfer equipment or it needs to be used as a winterizing agent for um, equipment. Next, we have paint. Uh, paint has probably generated uh, the most questions regarding the definitions of universal waste. Uh, paint is pigmented or unpigmented powder coating. Pigmented, unpigmented mixture of a binder and a suitable liquid. The liquid could be a solvent. The liquid can be water, hence water based. Um, it's generated from commercial, industrial, mining, agricultural, and post-consumer activities. Uh, and a paint forms an, adhere an adhering coating on a surface upon drying or through the use of heat. Uh, the application of use through heat is added to within the definition of paint because that's how power coatings are applied to a surface. So, when we developed this definition of paint, we intended it to include products that are commonly known as paint. They're used to decorate, they're used to protect, they're used to convey uh, a message or a design, and they're applied in a thin coat. So, what substances are not paint? And th these are questions that we, you know, people ask, is X a paint? And the answer is no, adhesives are not a paint. Stucco and cement paste coatings, no. Geotextiles, geomembranes, these are not a paint, even though they are kind of, they can be sprayed on in a certain area. Uh, surface leveling products, insulation products, spray foams, petroleum asphalt products, none of those were considered when we developed the definition of paint. Also, ingredients used to make paint, your solvent, your binder, your pigment, if you have a two-part um, component paint where you use, you know, which is common in epoxies, you have your part A and your part B. If these things are disposed of or discarded separately, they are not paint. If you have binder that has been expired and you can't use that, that is not paint. That needs to be evaluated to determine if it's a hazardous waste and is subject to full uh, regulation under the hazardous waste rules if it is. So, next we come to paint-related waste. Paint-related wa waste is a material that is legitimately contaminated with paint. It needs to be contaminated with paint in order to be a paint-related waste. And these uh, wastes are generated from the packaging of paint, wholesale retail operations, paint manufacturing, paint application, and removal activities. Ways that are not paint-related, demolition debris. If you, as an example, are doing a lead abatement project at a commercial facility and you remove drywall and you remove doors and you remove windows, that is not a paint-related waste. That is a de demolition debris waste and it needs to be managed accordingly. Now, if you decide to scrape the door and remove the paint or scrape the window, then that would be a paint-related waste. So, and then again, ingredients to make paint are not a paint-related waste. They are a unused product that you are disposing of and it needs to be evaluated to determine if it is a hazardous waste. So there are four entities in the Universal Waste Program that, that participate. Uh, first off, we have uh, handlers. We have two categories of handlers. 
A handler is a person that either generates a universal waste or collects a universal waste from other handlers. Um, so your small quantity handler generates or stores less than 5,000 kilograms total of universal waste. And by total, I mean of all the different types of universal waste, batteries, bulbs, antifreeze, aerosol cans. It's the, the total of all the different forms. Then a large quantity handler generates or stores equal to or greater than 5,000 kilograms total of universal waste. Then we also have our universal, universal transporters. They, too, also have some regulations uh, to comply with. And then we have our destination facilities. And a destination facility is a permitted hazardous waste facility that treats the universal waste in a way other than allowed under the handler rules. So under the universal waste provisions, Ohio did not did not create uh, new requirements. We followed the general format of the existing universal waste rules. Um, and these general provisions apply to all the universal waste. There's going to be tank and container standards. If you use a tank, you're generally going to be subject either to the small um, hazardous waste generator tank requirements or the large hazardous waste generator tank requirements. As far as container standards, they're provided in the universal waste rules, and it's pretty much straightforward, kind of common sense. Use a container in good shape. Use one that's not leaking. Um, keep it closed when waste is not being added or removed. There is also a labeling requirement under universal waste. The, Tank and container need to be labeled so that it identifies what that tank or container is holding, such as a, you know, a tank with antifreeze. You can put used antifreeze or universal waste antifreeze or UW antifreeze or spent antifreeze, something that indicates what is in uh, that tank or container. And then there's an, uh, uh, an accumulation time limit applicable to all universal waste or storage time limit, you might want to call it. And universal waste can be stored on site up, up to one year. Then they need to be removed uh, from the facility and sent off for proper treatment. Uh, there's a training requirement. All employees whose responsibilities involve the handling of these different universal waste ty types need to be trained on the proper handling and the rules applicable to their management. Uh, spill cleanup requirement is really straightforward. Basically, if you spill it, you clean it up in a timely manner, okay? There's nothing very complicated about the requirements we put in the rules. There's a notification requirement for large quantity handlers and destination facilities uh, to notify, to tell Ohio EPA that yes, I, I'm a handler of universal waste. Um, this is only a requirement if you have not already informed us that you're managing uh, universal waste or hazardous waste. There's a tracking requirement for large quantity handlers and destination facilities. This is basic business information. Um, if you receive universal waste, it's like who did you receive it from, how much did you receive, what is the date, what is the type. Uh, if you send universal waste to another handler or a destination facility, um, it's who did you send the waste to, what was it, uh, what is the date, how much, and all these, these few details are provided in the rules. The waste needs to be transported per uh, DOT requirements. Uh, there are also some universal waste requirements uh, in the provisions. And then next is waste specific management standards. Each of the new types of Ohio specific universal waste can uh, be managed or manipulated to some degree by the handler, and those are specified in rule, and um, we'll briefly go over those now. 
for antifreeze. The handler is going to need to develop a written procedure to prevent the commingling of antifreeze with other waste. This is because antifreeze is often commingled with uh, other, unfortunately, hazardous waste. Uh, so, in order to reduce the amount of, um, I guess, contaminated antifreeze, uh, the handler needs to develop a procedure to prevent the commingling and also use dedicated equipment um, such as collection and storage units for antifreeze. Now, antifreeze subsequent to generation, that's very important, mixed with used oil is classified as used oil. Now, we realize within the vehicle repair industry that antifreeze can become contaminated with used oil due to whatever en engine failure happened to occur. But antifreeze, after it's taken out of uh, the heat exchange equipment, if it is mixed with used oil, it is no longer a universal waste. It is a used oil and must be managed as a used oil. This is because the used oil rules are more stringent than uh, the universal waste rules. And then last, uh, handlers can recycle uh, their antifreeze on site. For aerosol containers, um, we developed a satellite accumulation area for aerosol containers. Uh, satellite accumulation area does not apply to any of the other types of universal waste, just to aerosol containers. This provision was provided because aerosol containers can be generated in a number of places, especially through a very large facility, and it's a burden to have to keep track of all the dates of all the drums that the that aerosol cans are being um, uh, collected in. So, for satellite accumulation area, once a container is full, you date the container. That's your one-year start date. Um, and you can also move it to a centralized collection area for your universal waste. Um, also, a handler may puncture, drain, and crush uh, aerosol containers. The contents removed from the containers is no longer is not a universal waste and must be evaluated to determine if it's a hazardous waste. This is because it is most likely a mixture of different chemicals and components. There is an exception to this rule if the waste removed from the containers solely consists of paint, then it would be a paint waste. And lastly, we remind you to do your best to recycle the container. Um, instead of just uh, throwing it in the solid waste stream. Okay, for paint-related paint waste, a handler may puncture, drain, and crush uh, containers of paint. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, collected paint is a universal waste. Uh, any handler can recycle universal paint waste. You can recycle it by giving it to someone else, sending it to another company who can use it in their formulations. Um, you can reclaim it for a solvent content if it, if it lends to that type of processing. However, if you have a paint-related waste, such as a spent solvent, only the handler that generated the material or generated the waste can recycle that waste on site. A handler that collects paint-related waste from other entities cannot reclaim paint-related waste unless you are a destination facility, a permitted TSD. If you do reclaim your paint-related waste, the residuals from reclamation is, um, are not a universal waste. You must determine if the waste is hazardous. And also, those residuals may be a listed hazardous waste. So, now we move on to the issues of confusion that have popped up over the past couple months. We've heard from people, well, you know, my aerosol cans, are, they're, they're universal waste, they're not hazardous waste. 
therefore, you know, listings aren't going to apply to the contents taken out. Uh, that's not correct. Universal wastes are a unique group of hazardous wastes. It's just they are subject to less burdensome generator and transporter requirements. They're still a hazardous waste. The Universal Waste Program is an optional regulatory program. Just because we said that aerosol cans are eligible to be classified as a universal waste doesn't mean you have to follow the universal waste rules. You could still follow the hazardous waste rules. Or if it's non-hazardous, you don't have to follow either program. So um, it is an optional program. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the universal waste rules are a program that provide for less burdensome requirements for the generator and the transporter of universal waste. However, once the universal waste gets to a destination facility, it needs to be managed in full compliance with the full-blown hazardous waste rule. <clears throat> so this is going to mean that the land disposal restrictions, co commonly referred to as LDRs, apply to the treatment of the universal waste. In order to do this, the destination facility is going to need to know certain types of information, such as what is the waste, why is it hazardous? What waste codes would otherwise apply? What constituents of concern are in the waste? And they are likely going to ask the handler who sent them the waste for this information. So even though it's not a requirement under the universal waste rules for the generator or for the handler to make a waste um, determination, you are still going to need to know some basic information about your waste stream in order for the destination facility to properly treat it. A destination facility may also be a handler. If the, des if the facility stores or treats the waste per the universal waste rules, then the facility is a handler. If the facility treats the waste in a manner not prescribed in the universal waste rules, the facility is a destination facility and needs to have a hazardous waste permit. Again, listed hazardous codes may apply to treatment residues of certain universal waste. This is going to be most common if you have a spent solvent from a paint-related waste um, that you reclaim. So you're going to need to know uh, what type of solvent it is in order to determine if the distillation bottoms from the reclamation process are also going to be listed. <clears throat> the use of a manifest, or more specifically, sending Ohio-specific universal waste to a facility outside of Ohio. Does it have to be manifested? How, is, how in general, how is managed? Most likely, the receiving state is going to say, Yes, that waste is a hazardous waste in our state, and it's going to need to be manifested in Kentucky, Indiana, Pennsylvania. So, but in Ohio, you don't need a manifest. So how, how do we resolve this situation? Uh, the easiest way to approach this is to use a manifest for shipping the waste out of state and in, on line 14 of the manifest, indicate that in Ohio, this waste is a universal waste and subject and managed under the universal waste rules in Ohio. Just as a, a point, uh, an important, important point, I, if you generate antifreeze, in Michigan, antifreeze is also designated as universal waste, so it most likely will not need a manifest in Michigan. But I do suggest you contact Michigan Department of Environmental Quality uh, to further find out what type of requirements may apply. <clears throat> Again, with the universal waste satellite accumulation container for aerosol containers, when the, when the collection contain, satellite accumulation container is full, 
you need to date it, close it up. You can move it to another um, central area for collection. Um, but main point is the one year time period begins when that uh, satellite accumulation container is full. In Ohio, aerosol cans are not categorically designated as a reactive D003 hazardous waste. This is an issue at the national level that is, uh, is not uniform across the states. Some states do say that all aerosol cans, just all aerosol cans are reactive hazardous waste. And that's based on the fact that when the aerosol can is heated, it can burst. Um, but Ohio does not take that position that that makes it an, uh, a reactive waste, because basically uh, any fluid in a container that is heated, uh, the container is going to eventually meet or uh, fail because the pressure in the container has exceeded uh, the limits of the construction of the container. Uh, aerosol cans of paint can be a universal aerosol container or it can be a universal paint waste. The handler gets to choose. The AABBCC or the air emission, hazardous waste air emission rules um, do not apply to universal waste. And this is most relevant for spent uh, paint-related solvents uh, contaminated with, with paint. Uh, so how can Ohio adopt these less stringent rules as compared to U.S. EPA? Well, in the 1990s, when EPA developed the base universal waste program, within that program they also adopted two rules that put forth criteria and allowed the, a state to adopt their own state-specific uh, universal waste rules. So when we became authorized for the base universal waste program, EPA basically said, okay, Ohio, your rules are equivalent to the federal rules and your rules operate in lieu of ours. So when EPA comes into Ohio, and inspect, say they inspect for the universal waste program, they are going to use Ohio's rules and not the federal rules. So a uh, few, uh, few words on rulemaking uh, that you can expect in the next year. Uh, Ohio EPA is working on revising rules so to accommodate the e-manifest uh, system. Um, Hopefully you, you've heard about this because basically it goes live on June 30th. Uh, US EPA has been developing an electronic uh, manifest system for probably about the last eight years. Um, it launches June 30th and um, hopefully your TSD has been in contact with you. Uh, so, because they're the ones who are primarily going to be kind of like the point person for this. This is a national program. It will be effective uh, um, across all, all 50 states and territories. Uh, the generator improvements rule. Uh, we are currently developing this rule. This is a, a federal rule. Uh, EPA made about 60 uh, changes to the generator rules. Most prominent is they reorganized uh, the generator rules. They, they, kind of, they developed one rule for large quantity generators, one rule for small quantity, and one rule for conditionally exempt um, generators, which are now called very small generators. So, but, uh, this kind of this kind of this makes understanding the generator rules easier instead of kind of referencing and flipping back and forth uh, between different chapters. Um, also, they have uh, a provision for episodic generation, so a generator doesn't necessarily have to follow 
uh, large quantity handler or large quantity generator rules, if they have, you know, uh, suddenly generate large amounts of waste that they were not expecting. Um, we are also working on state-specific uh, exclusion. It's called contaminated apparel and wipes rule, where apparel and certain wipes that are contaminated um, but are sent for laundering and returned for use are, will not be subject to regulation under the hazardous waste rule. At the federal rulemaking level, oh, in the apparel and wipes rule, we expect to propose that um, hopefully next week. It's in sign off right now, so it, it will be soon. Um, at the federal level, EPA just closed their comment period on their own universal waste uh, aerosol can rule. Uh, hopefully, um, their rule won't impact ours too much. Ohio didn't make comments and encourage them, you know, to kind of see things a little more our way than their way. So uh, we'll see what happens in the future on that. Uh, expect the ignitability characteristic, D001, um, identification uh, to be, or rule to be uh, changed. The method used in, uh, in that rule to determine if something is ignitable uh, is basically obsolete. So EPA is um, developing a new method and they hope pro to propose that soon. Uh, also, there's kind of talk that they may change uh, the provision that allows um, uh, liquids that have less than 24% alcohol uh, to no longer be, um, well, to be no longer excluded from being an ignitable waste. So we think they might be doing that, but they're, they've been, EPA's been pretty close lipped. Uh, the pharmaceutical rule, US EPA promises it'll be out this year. Uh, they're shooting for o October 2018. Uh, again, they've, been, they've given no prior information as to what this rule looks like. Circle 108B, this has to do with financial assurance. EPA is evaluating whether oil refineries, chemical plants, and coal power plants should be uh, subject to having financial assurance for certain parts of their operation. Again, EPA is not uh, released any type of information as to whether they will or will not, um, you know, require financial assurance. But by court order, they are required by December 2018 to make some type of determination. And then last but not least uh, is the definition of solid waste, also known as the hazardous waste recycling rules. Uh, EPA this was just came out, I think, this, this month or in May. Uh, that addresses the decisions made by the court. Uh, the rule had to be changed. The court, it was a court order change. Uh, EPA, the definition saw waste rule has been changed to go back to the transfer-based approach uh, instead of the verified recyclers approach. Um, so, uh, for information, more information and other resources, uh, you have questions, you can contact your local uh, Ohio, Ohio EPA district office uh, with, in the hazardous waste program. If you happen to know your inspector, that's a great resource also. Give him or her a call. Also in the central office here in Columbus, we have the hazardous waste compliance assistance and inspection support uh, group, and they can be reached at that number. Um, also, we have guidance document and a question and answer document on our website. Uh, basically, all the issues of uh, confusion are addressed in the question and answer document. Uh, I think there's, so far there's like 40, 43 questions answered on that document. And then for a copy of the universal waste rules, you can go to this link, uh, and the rules are found in 3745, two, chapter 273 of the Ohio Administrative Code. So, thank you very much for your participation.
and uh, we'll be taking questions now. Can a generator transport its own universal waste? For example, in a case where the county waste facility does not charge if you deliver universal waste to them? Uh, the short answer is yes, you can. Uh, just be aware there are universal waste transporter requirements. They're not extensive um, within uh, the universal waste rules. And also, you need to follow any DOT uh, requirements. So you may want to contact the Public U Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, um, con uh, often referred to as PUCO, uh, for further information on, on that aspect. Can a non-Ohio generator send in universal waste paint to an Ohio TSD if that non-Ohio state also recognizes paint as universal waste? The answer to, to this is yes. Um, as you're probably aware, that paint may come in on a hazardous waste manifest because it's going to be coming through states that will not recognize it as a universal waste. Because the only other states um, that have a universal waste kind of coatings or paint um, is New Jersey. think Pennsylvania, and definitely Texas. So there aren't too many of them. Okay, under the hazardous waste satellite accumulation rules, the satellite waste must be, oh, uh, let's see, I have <laughs> to scroll go. down here a second, <laughs> under the control of the operator. This has always been interpreted as having line of sight to the waste. Is it the same with universal waste since the container is being shared by more than one area? And what would meet the requirement? Okay. Satellite accumulation area for aerosol containers. And that's all that the satellite accumulation applies to. We are not putting in this concept of in the site of the generator or under the control of the generator or handler. Um, it is just a container that is on the working floor of the facility where these wastes are generated to accommodate the collection of aerosol cans uh, from the activities that, you know, occur within the commercial or the manufacturing facility. Okay. Does the dating of the satellite accumulation container for aerosols also apply to paint and paint-related material containers? in the satellite accumulation areas? The answer is no. The satellite accumulation area only, uh, only applies to aerosol cans. Now, if it's aerosol cans of paint, yes, it would apply. But in general, it only applies to aerosol cans and no other type of universal waste. Hey, what can we do with non-empty aerosol cans that are not paint or paint-related waste? Okay, non-empty aerosol cans, you can collect them as universal waste, put them in a container, send them to a facility for um, proper treatment. You can send it to another handler where that handler may want to puncture the cans and, and drain them. And what was the other part of it? Not paint or paint-related waste. Okay. So they're not empty, not no paint, paint-related waste. So, or as a handler, you can also puncture your own cans on site, um, manage the collected material appropriately, and send the metal cans off for uh, reclamation. Okay, I have always understood that aerosol cans were never considered empty because there would always be a propellant remaining in the can. Okay, it's, stop right there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't agree with that statement. I think aerosol cans can be empty. Um, basically, if you push the nozzle and nothing comes out, 
you know, all the propellant has been released. Um, that's one aspect that can render it empty. And also that it does not contain a significant amount of liquid. And I know these terms are real subjective um, because you can't open an aerosol can necessarily and look inside. Um, but if it's at atmospheric pressure and the can does not contain significant amount of liquids, which, you know, I really wish there was some, like, definite test to do this, but generally we believe that a can is empty if it has less than two, than, I'm sorry, one and a half tablespoons of liquid in it. And I know that doesn't help much either, but it's something. So um, that's as close as we can get to that question. Uh, with EPA's uh, aerosol can proposal, the concept of empty was probably one of the number one concerns that commenters had, because this is an issue that's been going around and around and around for the last 25 years. And it's just time that it be put to bed, so hopefully, um, we can actually get an answer at the national level so all the states can be the same. But um, this was the, second part. the second part of the question is, is that the reactivity issue of D00, meaning the propellant that's in the aerosol cans uh, that you mentioned? Um, I don't know because Ohio does not take, does not adhere to the, the rationale other states use as to why a aerosol can is reactive. We would only consider it reactive if the substance, the product in it is actually reactive, which is really unlikely to be a reality, so. Okay, is a designated area required for universal waste besides aerosol cans? Like, is a sign universal waste required? No. Um, an area where universal waste is stored or accumulated does not need to be, uh, there needs to be no signage. However, any tank or any container in which universal waste is held needs to be labeled, not necessarily the area. Okay, solvent reclamation that ends up creating still bottoms, are these still bottoms considered universal waste? No, still bottoms are residual from the reclamation of a universal waste, um, and most likely a paint-related waste, and those are no longer considered a universal waste. They no longer meet the definition of a paint or a paint-related waste. If a universal waste aerosol can is punctured, are there any requirements to control the emissions of the propeller? Under the hazardous waste universal waste rules, the answer is no. However, there may be requirements through the air program, depending on the particulars of your facility. Um, we do have some requirements. Um, that kind of considered the presence of the propellants through the puncturing activity, and that is that it be in a well-ventilated, the puncturing occur in a well-ventilated area, and also that no ignition source um, uh, be close to the puncturing unit. And, and please be aware that butane and propane, uh, these aerosols are heavier than air. So they are going to go to the floor. They are not going to go um, up. So uh, that's one thing to consider when looking for your ignition sources. If a paint is at 120 degrees Fahrenheit splash point, is it a universal waste? Splash point has nothing to do whether a paint, um, whether a paint is a universal waste or not. It's whether it meets the definition of paint. Um, so, yes, if it has a flash point of 120 or a flash point of 150, it would, you know, still be a universal waste. 
And our final chatted in question is, is this seminar eligible for any CEUs? And no, we do not do that with our webinars. Um, so many professional organizations have different requirements that would be hard for us to, you know, coordinate all of that. So as I mentioned before, we're recording the seminar. We'll put it on the web page. We'll, I will send out an email once it's posted. You can access the slides, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So if you want to try to get CEU credit from your professional organization, you can, you know, send them the link, send them the PowerPoint, and have, have you know, go through that process with, your, with those organizations. And that's all we have today. We appreciate your participation. Uh, if you have very specific questions that weren't answered today, please contact Karen. I'll also include her contact information uh, and also the um, inspection support unit that she, that she mentioned earlier in the presentation. And again, we would appreciate it if you'd take a minute and complete our evaluation when you go to the SurveyMonkey website. We're always looking to improve our webinars and add new topics that our customers are interested in. So thank you and have a great day.